Welcome to this episode of Prairie People's Poetry, a spotlight series highlighting Saskatchewan spoken word artists through performances and conversation on the craft and community of the art form. I'm your host, Kat Abenstein, and today we're talking with spoken word poet, artist, and musician, Devin Dosla, who also performs as G.B. Loon. Hi, I'm Devin Dosla. I perform as G.B. Loon. Uh, especially with spoken word stuff and then also with uh, with the band. So Devin, can you tell me a little bit about your art? Sure, yeah. Um, I can tell you about my art. It's uh, what I love to talk about. Um, my art is just uh, kind of a series of um, expressions, to use a cliche, but it, it's usually just a way of me kind of like transmitting um, a viewpoint or like an angle of a something and trying to get people on board with that. So it'll often be like uh, a spoken word piece or a song or or something like that that's about a common thing, but maybe from like a, a funny angle so that it's, um, it's twisted and, and comical in some way. So where do you draw your inspiration from? Uh, I think I just draw my inspiration from uh, like everywhere. Um, I try to root a lot of my things in like um, just kind of very uh, basic like Saskatchewan Canadian life um, and oftentimes I'm making fun of those things but um, with most of my spoken word and songs these days I've kind of put aside a lot of the more like flowery pretentious sort of stuff and I'm usually just trying to like get through to people and make them laugh or, or um, think about something maybe in a different way and so when I want to achieve that it usually means that I'm honing in on something that is common to everybody. It's dusk for this juicy narrative steak's sake. It's dusk and a hipster wearing 60s looking sunglasses a 60s looking haircut, 90s looking shirt, and a 70s looking Ramones jacket that's been brought from a dim, needlessly black and white photo into the land of color to reveal a denim plot twist stands alone with a faithful six string. The only thing it's always been cool to wear. It's dusk, kind of. And he busks, kind of. Fingers like awkward tusks, kind of strumming strings. And a husky, busky voice sings original songs and covers violent femmes and T-Rex. Till an actual T-Rex wrecks this moment. This T-Rex is one step away from fossil, but still big and mean. He is a meteor that leaves a crater where there was lush green. He works at the liquor store, where I'm currently busking. And without even Kanye's courtesy, he doesn't let me finish. He just roars and says, we don't want you here. At first, I'm nice and willfully comply, like the kids in Jurassic Park. What I should have said was, look at these bourbon-loving suburbanites driving suburbans into this dingy lot. We know that it's me they've been coming to see. To forget about life for a while. And, you know, buy something that can bask in their sad face flasks. But I think we both know no one's coming to see me, and no one's given me any money, which is why I don't see the big deal. But I smile, and he glares at me. Bears sharp teeth, he releases a carnivorous snort, so I give him this retort, okay? You don't have to be a dick about it. Dude. Not a great line befitting a poet, but not that far off. Because if you propped up a flask of Johnson with a stick and added T Rex arms and started to squint, you may get an idea of what this liquor store clerk with a gutter grocery bag for a face really looked like. But I digress. I leave. It's no big deal. I can play an open mic somewhere, I can play a set at the Creative City Center. Maybe a house show. I have that luxury. But imagine the First Nations artists who are given no jury. They're just judged. Art forms executed on the spot. The bigwigs decided, 
We must alter, natives. But that was a false alternative, a faulty alternative. Songs, languages, dances were told, We don't want you here. I was told that. But I was just a goofball playing his songs on private property on stolen land. The First Nations people were told that in their living rooms, in the middle of a house show. What do you think it takes to be funny? I think that there are a number of parts to being funny. I think that uh, one of the important things is um, just having like a really strong, um, almost like a mission statement or angle for the thing. A lot of the times it's like, what's this song about? Oh, it's like, uh, it's about long johns and um, how we wear them here because we're cold all the time and other people just think it's a joke or something like, and then from that, it's like, what can I make references to? What can I, what wordplay can I bring out? Um, what sort of like specific instances can I draw from that other people go, yeah, that's totally, that totally resonates with something I've done or whatever. Um, I also think that when you're, being funny, I think, I mean, it's weird to talk about like when I'm being funny, uh, but I think that you need to be specific. Like when people are being overly vague, um, it's usually not good enough. I think that you need to either hone in on a very specific experience um, or bring up a bunch of different examples or something so that um, for one, you, you seem like you've thought about it and done your research or whatever, but two, uh, people can kind of like lock in on those things. So what does your writing process look like? My writing process normally starts with me thinking of something on a drive or a bike ride or whatever, and then kind of putting that jot note information into my phone as quickly as I can. Um, and then depending on where I'm at at that moment. Um, if it's a long walk or something, I can kind of keep adding to it or a drive or something. Otherwise, I might come back to that idea and start fleshing it out a little bit. Um, and then usually from there, uh, I will, if it's something that I want to do a song with, I start to um, try to find what the chorus will be and, and figure that out and then um, add kind of chords to the verse or whatever. If it's a spoken word thing, it's it's usually, for a comedic piece at least, I need um, kind of a what is this about. Um, it can't be like, first I talk about um, like allergies and then I'm gonna talk about like, it's always, I think, and it's the same with if it's um, social justice or anything else, I think you need a, a message. It's just with comedy, it's, um, it's more of a joke. <laughs> so how, how have you become a better artist? Yeah, I think I've become a better artist by um, worrying a little bit more about uh, what the audience or listener um, is able to take away from what I'm saying. I really enjoyed um, kind of doing very cryptic, uh, dense spoken word stuff um, that was kind of dizzying for the audience and uh, I enjoyed kind of the uh, the confusion that would come out of that and kind of the um, the fun that comes with saying things that people can't put together they, they, they just this is crazy because my mind doesn't know um, what's actually going on with what you're saying but I like this phrase and I like this phrase and I don't know how they connect but it's cool but I did find a little bit of frustration came from um, people not knowing what the song or the um, spoken word piece or whatever was about. And uh, for my own vain reasons, I would feel like the concept was pretty cool. Um, for instance, I with one of my old bands, I had this weird song about, um, it was from the point of view of Pac-Man, uh, running away from all these ghosts and demons and not feeling like there's any way out of this space. Um, and I felt like the concept was really fun and I really liked it as a piece of writing, but it bugged me that no one knew that that's what it was about because it, it was too opaque, it was too covered. Um, and so what I've enjoyed doing is keeping a lot of the music and the structures of whatever's underneath the words a little simpler 
so that I can make sure that um, the message comes through more clearly. And I've found that with my own personal style of writing that does lean towards humor a lot more, um, people need to kind of get the joke. So you need to kind of make it pretty clear what you're talking about. Dear Ridley Scott, you've changed, man. It used to be about human obliteration. Ear splitting, tongue stuck in a lock roof screams, carnivorous beacons of humanity's doom burrowing through your weak, illogically constructed bodies, with the potential virtue of estrangement lurking behind some books. My friends and I actually enjoyed your 1979 thriller Alien, and Prometheus as well, but The Martian? Trash. Star Drek. Honestly, Ridley, I have half a mind to blast over there and teach you a lesson. What were you thinking when you made a film called The Martian that doesn't feature any voracious extraterrestrial beasts? Nary a tentacle nor extra tit to be found. Bradbury, this ignoble abomination in cinnamon-looking dirt, and use some Philip K. Dickian excuse to void it from everyone's memory. Here on Mars, we've let slide many interpretations of our culture from many an author and auteur, but this? In War of the Worlds, I appreciated the octopus-esque machines that chewed through your cozy pavement to wreak havoc. The Martians and Mars attacks, vexatious and sufferable clods that they were, were still amusing to watch as they disintegrated incredulous Earth vermin. Hell, I even enjoyed the Martian mutant weirdos in 1990's Total Recall. All I'm saying is, paint us Martians with whichever brush you like, but don't call a film The Martian that only features some dopey biped in a spacesuit. At least beam up some Geiger wannabe and have them draft up some metallic probe by proboscis fiends. Give me something here, Ridley. If I'm going to have to sit through an Earth film, it better be somewhat tri-titillating. Honestly, I, I probably wouldn't be so annoyed if it weren't for all these articles and posts about how realistic the film is. Sure, a sagacious botanist could conceivably grow potatoes in his own poop, and maybe he could send a message back to Earth, but do you know why this wouldn't happen, Ridley? Cause we'd vaporize him! That cocky little spit wouldn't make it ten feet without being pulverized by our tecular Belcron cannons, and sure, he could drive his doom buggy into the sunset like a smug little cowboy on a horse, as long as we didn't send him to his imminent demise with our make-a-quake rupture escaline discord discs. Sorry. Ridley Scott, you've done some fine work. But the next time you make a film with Martian in the title, you better make sure it features some ridiculous, clearly conceived in a human brain alien in it, or I will show up on set and put a Martian into the movie. And we don't look anything like Matt Damon. So what are some things that you talk about in your work? In my work, I, I have a few different sides. One of them is I really like to talk about books and old movies and video games, like a lot of kind of these fun, geeky things that have been a part of my whole life. I really love pop culture, and so... I love diving into those things. And one thing that I really enjoy is like uh, researching um, a specific thing. If I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do uh, a spoken word piece that's, um, that's all about like platformer video games or something. And I'll have like one idea that I'm talking about. Maybe it's like the characters are just kind of off the cuff or something, but maybe the characters are trying to figure out uh, why they just have to like jump from thing to thing um, and kind of like relate that to someone's life of feeling trapped or whatever. Um, but then in, in deciding that I get to kind of revisit a ton of these old games and kind of like try and draw out some funny points and stuff. So I would say that a big part of what I talk about is pop culture and really jumping into nerd culture-y stuff. Um, and then the other side of it especially being like a bit of a folk and country artist in Saskatchewan is um, kind of flipping the um, expectations of the genres that I'm playing, whether it's folk or punk or country. Um, when I'm writing a punk song, I'll often 
be uh, I'll often attempt to make fun of what punk songs are about um, and often just leave those regular subjects altogether but sing them as if I'm talking about that so like whereas you have a lot of political uh, stuff involved with punk lyrics I recently wrote a, a, a song kind of against wasps as if they're like the government or as something else right um just and it's like a funny thing because it's something people all agree with i hate wasps you know in the same way that people are like oh yeah that government sucks you know but it's ridiculous and uh bizarre because it's about like a bug that bites us that we don't like and so i'll often try to take the the things that a genre always does and like still work within that tradition but flip the specifics a bit so how do you think the internet has affected the way that you create art? I think the internet has affected the way I create art, create art in a lot of ways, partly just because of how much content is out there. Like, especially I love satire and I love um, tongue in cheek stuff. I even write my own kind of satirical video game um, articles and stuff like that. And so there's so much out there, um, so many like satirical sites that I'm reading all the time. And I think whether I like acknowledge it or not, I think I've learned a lot from the, the way they kind of tackle issues. And oftentimes, yeah, they're talking about uh, things that we all remember from our childhood, but other times they're talking about um, important political issues or um, traumas or all these different things that are like, that everyone's talking about um, whether it's the news or uh, kind of like activists or whatever, but they're also like bringing in humor. Um, and I think I've really borrowed a lot of that in my own writing as well. Uh, and then otherwise just, I mean, the internet is, you know, you can find anything you want all the time. And so I, when I'm researching things, you know, researching, um, it's so easy for me to uh, dive into all these these old pieces of pop culture and stuff just by looking into them a little bit. And so I think it helps to strengthen um, the actual lyrics and the the verses and stuff because I can go, oh, what was that character in Zelda called or something, rather than using some more generic thing because I can't think of the specifics or whatever. It's really easy to quickly bring up a bunch of things and um, draw from those. Are you not entertained? You hold the reins attached to these spastic white horses. You judge your fabricated gladiators. You feign an understanding of those whom you think are slaying through blood stains. But if you tried staying, and better yet, getting off your elevated cup holder equipped high chair and talk to some of these strange glitch people flailing about, you may find they aren't so much flaying as aggressively massaging each other. Like Commodus, you sit on the fringe of the chaotic play, making your judgments about the kids in the punk rock pits. They're animals, driven by rage and bloodlust, you spit. You've seen this punk rock-driven decay from the periphery. You wrote the punks off when you saw Sid Vicious depressingly looking for hay in a heroin needle stack. They're all hopped up on something. You know, at first they took their safety pins, pierced their noses and earlobes. Eventually they just used the pins to pierce their brains. Well, no, I explain. A lot of these folks are sober straight edge punks and you think they're trying to hurt each other, but just wait until someone goes down. The punks with spikes on their shoulders and hair that's trying to carve phrases into the ceiling will help the fallen stranger. There aren't any spikes on their hands. I've come out of mosh pits, bruised and bloody, too many spaced out stage dives, too many crapulous falls from grace, but I thank the faceless punk angel that picked me up three times for every beer I had. You think these people are sadistic, but they're just getting their cardio and counseling through pinballed, combat booted, patch jacketed, splatter painted neutron imitation. After the show, I thank one of the guys that kept catching me and helping me up, and I shake his hand. I noticed he has big holes in his hands, which threw me off because it made it look like he had been propped up on a cross for a while. He explains the holes are actually from climbing over then dancing with too much barbed wire. Figures, 
But thinking I ran into Jesus at a hardcore show got me thinking about how stupid multiple choice tests are when they don't let anybody draw anything. Judging any person as A, B, C, or D distracts us from the love they hand out, the love lotion on carved pumpkin palms. You can't understand anything from the sidelines. The news said Icarus committed suicide, but I knew him, and he was just trying to fly. Now, I love metaphors and symbols as much as anyone, but my favorite punk shows are the ones where the symbols and the rest of the drum kit have been reduced to cool Persian welcome mats that litter the pit floor, and there's binaries no more, and people remain. A lot of people don't understand the appeal of punk rock music, or mosh pits, or religion for that matter, but I think anything that causes someone to show kindness to someone else, he, she, they have never met, is not something that needs to be written off. It's something that needs to be noticed, explored, and written about. So just to change gears a little bit, can you tell me the difference between spoken word poetry and slam poetry? What, what the difference is between s spoken word poetry and slam poetry is a difficult question that a lot of people have spilled ink over. Um, I would say that oftentimes, and most of the time maybe, slam poetry uh, is kind of underneath spoken word in that it, it features spoken word. And uh, I always thought spoken word was kind of a silly uh, thing to call what we're doing. Um, just because there are a lot of cases where people are speaking words and it's not spoken word. Uh, and then there's, you know, you know what I mean? And then there's also like, of course you're speaking the words because you're not farting them out or something, you know? Like, so it doesn't, um, but it's that nice kind of umbrella term that now describes uh, something and we all know what it is. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, slam is also a tough thing to define, but generally speaking, Slam poetry is uh, usually a uh, spoken word that is used to try and sway audiences and get um, points and uh, maybe awards and titles and stuff, whereas spoken word just um, covers all the different things that we do often without accompaniment or something where it's focusing on the words rather than a, a melody or something. So what do you think about slam poetry, like in terms of... Um, the game that slam is? I am really grateful that slam poetry has been a part of my life because um, I think it really helped me to um, notice what kind of what other people were doing and what works well and what doesn't. Um, it also slams gave me a place to really um, like work on new work all the time because slams were happening so regularly that I always wanted fresh work to do and it was a good way of uh, inspiring me to create a lot of work. Um, but as a lot of people kind of end, end, uh, end up doing, I got a little bit, uh, I just got a little tired of the slam poetry kind of format and, and, the, and the scene and the types of things that it brings out of people. One of the big problems that people have with spoken word is that, or with slam scenes, uh, is that it ends up kind of uh, molding new voices and whatever, um, like less experienced styles, um, those people with those styles, it morphs them kind of and molds them into uh, just a copy of whatever is doing well at that time. Um, and so I've often found that people will come to slams uh, and they have something really neat and fresh. It's a, a style that we're not used to or something like that. But um, the audience is often looking for a certain style that um, a lot of people that have that style are really polished and uh, really effective when they're um, doing spoke or spoken word stuff at a slam in that style. And then the other people who have different styles might not be as polished. The work might be less accessible, um, but I think the writing is often better, um, but those people end up becoming frustrated with being told their ninth or tenth place or whatever, and then they will um, just change their writing and make it more accessible and um, simpler and just kind of more poppy so that people will score it higher. The other thing that I have a problem with uh, sometimes is just that um, slamming is, is relying on um, just uh, anybody 
who comes in to kind of tell you how good the poem is. And I think that's the best and worst part about a slam because it's awesome knowing that just somebody uh, off the street that you've never met is is telling you what they think of the, the piece with a number. Um, but also it, it does kind of uh, cause a bit of division because um, sometimes the the person who's listen, the the judges at least especially if you're talking about a specific subject something maybe more obscure uh, they might not know what you're talking about at all and so they didn't like the poem because they don't know what an atari 2600 is and you can't sometimes escape the uh the judgment um you'll still think that you did a bad job and that the poem sucks because these guys didn't like it and it might actually be really good. It's just that the judges um, weren't the right people to hear it or something. So, If I had a Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon t-shirt, for every Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon t-shirt I've ever seen, I would have as many Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon t-shirts as everyone else, apparently. It's not that Dark Side is a bad album. It's a legendary album. I just think some of these folks need to think outside of the three-sided box try another angle floyd had a prismatic career beyond the prism guys the uh, real floyd fans evade the droves of dark side of the moon children by blasting off in floydian psychedelic saucers full of secrets and the dark shirts of the moon culture all yell why are you running away way That's from the wall, but the only reason a Pink Floyd The Wall shirt doesn't start growing on you during adolescence is because these moon crater-brained youth don't think it's as cool to be another brick in the insipid wall. They'd rather be one of the rainbow streaks from the Dark Side cover, a note in the pretty triad. Well, I think Roger, Rick, David, and Nick just thought the pyramids are far out, man. <laughs> At first... I thought that Pink Floyd doing a set exclusively for the ghosts of Pompeii was a little insensitive to those of us who have done shows for empty rooms without planning on it. But then I realized I didn't mind if these dark side sprites and moon nymphs and black t-shirts left the show early because they just wanted to observe the great gig in the sky from their front yards. And I wanted them to leave their strict indolent orbital track and venture out into the deep, dissonant, peripheral black. So what advice would you give to people coming into the spoken word scene? I, I think that the biggest thing that people need to, um, the biggest thing that people need to do is um, not be afraid that people, that the audience won't um, understand their work because sometimes like you look at great paintings great all these other things that we have in in other media um, it, you don't need to be able to say what that is supposed to be representing you, it can just be beautiful on its own um, and we get really like worked into the idea that because this thing has words it needs to be conveying a message in the same way that an essay does or a, or a uh, like a, a news broadcast or something and conveying that same information is not always the most important thing in fact often the reason we're writing poetry we're writing in a different style and verse and stuff is so that we can get away from just saying something plainly um, and just getting the message across in the easiest way I think that having fun with language and um, kind of making it more obscure uh, is one of the best parts about poetry and I think that people uh, need to just make sure that the writing uh, does for them what they want it to do and not worry about um, how other people are um, making sense of those words. There is an accountability to that. You don't want to um, say things that are obviously going to make people upset. But I do think that if you're a little bit worried that it's not clear enough, um, that's not always the most important part about the work. Just if it's beautiful for you and it explores things in the way that you find um, 
creatively liberating, then you're doing it right. This has been Prairie People's Poetry with me, Kat Abenstein, as your host. Thanks to Devin Dosloff for his work, and thanks to you for tuning in. Make sure to like, share, and check out the other videos in our series. And be sure to let us know what you think. Thanks for supporting Prairie Poetry.